Alright, my name is Camden Co, and today I'll be taking you through .io game server architecture. So, starting it off, what is an .io game? Well, at the most basic level, it's just a game on the .io domain space. But in reality, the .io games have really created a niche for themselves with two simple principles. First, they must be massively multiplayer. The typical room will have anywhere from 50 to 200 clients which is like pretty immense for most web browser based games. You know, a typical web browser multiplayer game will have five, maybe six, but most IO games will handle upwards of 200 in a single room. And secondly, they have to be simple. The majority of .io games are only rendered in HTML5 canvas, and that's it. No WebGL, no 3D rendering, it's just canvas, images, and text. And this allows for very low spec computers to run them. So anything from five-year-old mobile devices to 15-year-old laptops, they can all run .io games. And with these two factors together, .io games are able to become extremely viral. You know, passed around, thrown around, started, and finished very easily. So here's kind of the founding father of .io games, Augur.io. Now this game, when it came out, it completely stormed the web because in a lot of ways, it really was the first game to really master both the massively multiplayer and the simple aspects that all .io games have nowadays. It made $23 million in the first quarter, had 40,000 to 160,000 users per day, and over 10 million downloads on the App Store in the first week. So this game was really popular. So let's now get into game servers and what's the difference between a game server and a typical express server that you might set up with a web application so with some definitions server side this is our general umbrella term for anything done on the game owner side so physics calculations rendering requests all of it gets handled server side and the client is any user in any device so phones laptop etc a loop is it's just a single server side update so during our game, we have a bunch of different updates that go on, and this happens in a loop. So say every 50 milliseconds, we render all the physics. We render every single part of the game inside of our loop, and then our packet is information that is sent to and from every server slash client. Okay, so this looks a little bit intimidating, but this is really just everything that we've been doing so far with logging in. Logging into a game server is very similar to signing into any other web application. And if you want more information, I definitely recommend checking out the URL to the side, buildnewgames.com slash real time multiplayer. But if you look at this graph, it's pretty similar to anything you'd expect. A client connects to a server, the server authentic authenticates the client, sends back a room, and then you know, the, it opens up a persistent connection with the client and the server through some type of web sockets. And then through that consistent connection, that's where the actual gameplay happens. And that's where the tough part comes in. So let's talk about the server design requirements. So the three main things that separate a game server and a web application server is low latency, the ability to accept and send out many packets, and most importantly, is to keep all players in sync. Now, the first two things kind of go hand in hand. Low latency and acceptance sending out many packets, that, would, that means that you want to have the least amount of information possible, right? Small amounts of information means less bandwidth, less time, less load, less resources. And with less, you know, less resources, it's easier to send out more packets. But then the question is, where do we draw that balance in between small amounts of information and ensuring that all of our players would be in sync? Sure, it'd be frustrating if your game was laggy, you know, if it had slow updates. What's even more frustrating is just dying or just having players that don't make sense where they are, resources that are vanishing off screen, and that happens when players fall out of sync. So when you're designing a game, it really is a large balancing act between latency and resources and, you know, ensuring that the game is in sync at all times. So I think the best way to really understand game server design is through example. So let's design snake, a snake MMO. So let's go over the anatomy of snake. Um, if any of you remember, you know, there's like phones that had this game. 
Basically, it's just a simple game where there's a snake that walks around and can't hit itself or walls, and it has to grab randomly spawned food within boundaries. And when the snake picks up the food, it grows, making the game harder and harder. So instead of the traditional single player game, let's think about what the server is going to look like for a multiplayer implementation of a snake. So at this point, we're like this, right? We're like, hell yeah, let's jump into it. But this is the part where the balancing gets really hard because we have to figure out what we're going to send and when do I send it, right? And this is not only on the server side, but also on the client side. Because as a web developer, we get to decide you know, how the client interacts with the server. So we get to decide everything, which makes us look a little bit more like this, where it's just like, oh my goodness, how the hell do we do this? So a couple ideas that are floating around is we can set a packet on key press, right? So you know, if you're using your arrow keys to interface with your game, perhaps you can have the client send an update to the uh, server then. Or another idea would be send a packet on a timer. So have the local client interface with the machine, right? Have it run updates, and then let's say every 100 milliseconds, the packet, the server, and the client can you know have a conversation with each other on a set timer. Or another idea is to use a server event. So perhaps when a new client joins, that would be a server event that would trigger a connection or a packet to be sent. All these are valid ideas. And different game servers will use different combinations of these threes, depending on how complex the game is, how many different inputs you're going to send. And even though the all .io games are typically very simple compared to a very full-fledged you know, multiplayer game, these are all considerations you have to take into place. And like, <coughs> there's many other ways to set up your server architecture. But in general, what I'd recommend is like some combination of all three of these. So, Having some type of client side validation for key presses, but then after a valid set of key presses to send it to the server. You know, certain server events that affect certain players, that should be sent back. And then, you know, on a timer, just making sure that all your players are in sync. All right, so what does this look like? So here's an image. So um, it's really just what I explained right there, where it's a little bit of a mixture of all three. So here's a recommended server setup for a large multiplayer game. So we start off with our client. So let's say your client presses right three times, and you'd expect you know, three movements to the right after that. Well, instead of having three individual messages, we send this in one big bundle message over to our server. And then on our server, we have a giant stack of all these different you know, inputs from our users. And then after we have this giant stack of all these inputs, we start parsing through it one at a time. And this is what we call our physics loop, or just you know, as we defined before, our loop. Here we calculate, hey, look, is our snake interacting with any food? Is our snake colliding with the walls? Is our snake colliding, you know, should our snake be growing? Should our snake be spawning, et cetera? This is where it takes place. And then the server will send an update in a loop. So every single time it finishes rendering the physics for a loop, it will then send out the updated view information to all the users. So then all the users will have a unified view based off the server. So this might be a little bit confusing, but Here's the best way of explaining it. The client is really just an interface, input, output. Very little calculations are being done there. So the client is sending in all the inputs to the server. The server is doing all the thinking for it. And then the server is sending information, hey, load this image here, load this image here, load this block here, load this block here. The computer, the client has no idea what these blocks means. It has no idea what's going on with these blocks. But the server does. And in that way, it really lessens the impact you have on your clients, allowing your client to be a very low spec machine. So here's another client uh, interaction just written out. So a client can press an arrow key, and then the client sends the key press. The server receives the key press, reads in all the inputs, runs the game logic, and then responds to everybody. And then when the client has the updated information, it'll then redraw onto the canvas, and then update to express any information. So here's a quote that Nick said, bad programmers worry about the code, good programmers worry about data structures and the relationships. So let's talk about data structures. And, but before we get there, I think um, let's just talk a quick, quick detour with their stack. The stack is all stuff that we're familiar with. You know, a game server in its heart is exactly the same as what we've been working with. HTML5 canvas, express with node, 
Zakadayo. So the most key part of the data we're being sent is the fact that we're sending it over the network. Network transactions are one of the most costly things that we have to deal with, right? You know, it's very expensive to send any amount of information over the, over the web. And when we're dealing with a game, we're sending information both ways anywhere between 50 to 100 milliseconds. So if we have 100 clients interfacing every 50 milliseconds, we really have to make sure that our updates are very clean and very quick. So let's talk about sockets. So the pros of sockets is obviously the ease of use and the reliability. You know, there's a bunch of different implementations of web sockets out there, but I have to say without a doubt, sockets.io is the easiest and most reliable socket package out there. But the only, and the cons are, is that it uses JSON by default, and that's relatively less efficient with greater than 100 users, which is, you know, it's a little bit more niche, but it's something to take into account. But the big part about um, using sockets with your game server is this first point, the fact that it uses JSONs by default. Now, a JSON is a lightweight data interchange format. It is easy for humans to read and write, and it is easy for machines to parse and generate. But if you think about it, if it is easy for humans to read, there's no way that JSONs are actually that lightweight because, because humans are inefficient. So there must be a more efficient way of sending information than a JSON. And so we're back to the drawing board. And, you know, and like one thing that we might have to do is send like a binary buffer through, web, through WS, which is tough. So luckily, with ES6, we have typed arrays. And typed arrays are exactly what it sounds like. It's just uh, arrays that have data, uh, data with very strict sizing. So let's just talk a little bit about the numbers game. Every letter in a JavaScript, JavaScript string is two bytes, and every number in 8-bit typed array is one byte. So objectively speaking, if you're just sending numbers, it's half the size. So, but we can take that one step further and not just send any strings at all. Instead, we can create utilities for both the client and the server to encode and decode typed arrays. So here's a sample. Um, if we're bringing it back to Snake, if we're sending information on key press, connection, and disconnect, one way that we do with JSON is by sending an event with the name key press with you know, a JSON that says key 132, which is the right arrow key. And this is 34 bytes. But if we choose to send a typed array, and we have you know, a server utility that turns key press 132 into either 1 through 4 with each integer uh, denoting a different direction, then we're just sending a single byte over our data uh, through, our, um, through our web socket, which is you know, significantly smaller, one byte versus 34. And this is um, just more information about that. I'm running out of time here, so I'm kind of blazed through it. But you know, here's a sample of JSON, what you would send to, from server to player, um, server to player with all the different information to render in a JSON, or in a JSON format. And then up top is what you do with a typed array where you use you know, zero as a, a stop code, and then you just send all your information like that, where it's just, um, you have to, cr basically, a hard part about server design is deciding a common language to send back and forth. If you remember back in our earlier days, we talked about how we send information over the web and with a flashlight example. It's very similar here. We have to find a way to use just you know, typed arrays to send information that is very complicated you know, with nested objects and arrays. So here's the conclusion. There's two major keys to designing a good game server. One is speed and the other is synchronicity. Speed is extremely important because if we want it to be viral, if we want it to be accessible, it needs to be quick, it needs to be lean, and it needs to be you know, social, local, and mobile. If we're talking synchronicity here, uh, the other major key is synchronicity. We need to ensure that all our players or have the same game at the same time to make sure it's not frustrating. And really making a good game server is balancing speed and synchronicity to ensure the best user experience. So here's some other information. Here's my, uh, here's my stuff on the left. And then here are some resources on the right. BuildNewGames.com is a great blog that has a bunch of different information about making HTML5 games, uh, phaser.io, is a framework for building games. And then here's one that goes really into the nitty gritty about optimizing your web sockets. So definitely check this out if you want more information. All right.